In this video, you're going to learn how to find average velocity and instantaneous velocity. So in general, suppose an object moves along a straight line according to an equation of motion, which we'll call it s equals f of t, where s is the displacement, which is actually a directed distance, meaning it has a direction, of the object from the origin at time t. So the function f um, that describes the motion is called the position function. And often we call motion along a line um, called rectilinear motion. So the displacement, which we'll call the change in the position of a particle over the time interval, let's say from t equals a to time t equals a plus h, a plus h, um, usually we take h to be a number that's greater than zero, is given by f of a plus h minus f of a. So what does this mean in real words? So if you take a look, um, a plus h would be a time that is a little bit more than a. So we're going to say that it's the final position at time t equal to a plus h. And if I subtract that from the initial position, at time t equals a, then I'll have my displacement. Um, so notice that displacement can be a positive or a negative number. So the average velocity over this time interval is uh, displacement divided by time, and hence displacement, which I just showed you here, would equal f of a plus h minus f of a. So that means this is my new position and this is my initial position. So the, when I subtract them, I will get the displacement all divided by my time minus my starting time. So when you simplify this, you actually get f of a plus h minus f of a, all divided by h. Now note, velocity consists of a magnitude and a direction, whether it's a positive or negative. However, when I talk about speed, or the average speed, it's only a positive value, so we can take the absolute value of my average velocity to find the average speed. So let's take a look at an example. Suppose that the position of a particle is given by s of t equal to 1 plus 3t minus 2t squared, where t is in second, seconds and s is in meters. So find the displacement and the average velocity over the time interval from 1 to 3. All right, so to find the displacement, remember that we need to know what our final position is and what our initial position is. So let's find out where we end up at. So we want to find out where the position is at time 3. So s of 3 is equal to 1 plus 3 times 3 minus 2 times 3 squared, which is 1 plus 9 minus 18, and that equals negative 8. So we end up at negative 8 which is actually to the left of the origin. Where did we start? Well, starting at time in one, when I place one into the function, I get one plus three times one minus two times one, all squared. So we get one plus three minus two, which equals two. So I start at two and I end up at negative eight. So my displacement is equal to negative 8 minus 2, which means I'm at, I, just, I had a displacement of negative 10 meters, which means that I went 10 meters left, if we're talking about direction. To find the average velocity, we'll call it VI, a V average, that is equal to, remember my displacement, which I just calculated to be negative 10, 
and that's going to be divided by my change in time. So I end up at 3, and my initial time was 1. So 3 minus 1, I get negative 10, divided by 2. So my average velocity was negative 5 meters per second. Which makes sense, since it was negative 10 meters, and then I've gone for 2 seconds, so it must have been 5 meters per second going to the left. Now, suppose we want to compute the average velocity over shorter and shorter time intervals. So a and a plus h. So let's say that h is actually getting smaller and smaller. So in other words, we want h to approach 0. Then the velocity at a particular time, or the instantaneous velocity, v of a at time t equals a, will be v of a equal to, now because a is approaching zero, that's where I introduce limits. So I want my h to get closer to zero. So if you recall, my formula was up here. So that's how we find the average velocity. But if I want h, that difference from a to a plus h, I want that to be really close. I want it to be zero. So I don't want it to barely move at all. So therefore, I want h to approach zero, and it'll be the same formula as above. So what's happening here is that my h is getting closer and closer to zero, so that I actually get just the velocity at that one point a. So notice that the velocity at time t equals a is equal to the slope of the tangent line at that point P. So let's take a look at what this looks like. So suppose we have a rock and it's dropped off um, a 1,250 feet building. It has a height S, which is in feet, above the ground at time T seconds, given by S of T, this formula here. What is the instantaneous velocity? So I'm looking for instantaneous of the rock after five seconds. Actually, it should say at five seconds. So we want to know what is that instantaneous velocity at that five second mark. All right, so we're going to say V instant is equal to the limit as H approaches zero. So I'm going to say S and I'm going to say five plus H minus s of 5. So 5 is my time that I'm interested in. h is that time a little bit moved over. But we do want h to be approaching 0. So this equals the limit as h approaches 0. And I'm going to take my 5 plus h, and I'm going to substitute it in for t here. So it's going to be using this whole formula, but it only substitute in for the t. So I have 1250 minus 16 times 5 plus h all squared. So this part here, this expression, is the s of 5 plus h. Now I'm going to subtract s of 5. So the 5, now I'm going to replace the t in the question. So I have 1250 minus 16 times 5 squared. And this is my position at time 5. And then all of this will be divided by h. So let's do this again. So the limit as h approaches 0. Let's do some simplifying. So 1250 minus 16. So we're going to expand the 5 plus h. So it's going to be 25 plus 10h plus h squared, because we remember we have to square the binomial. And over here, we get 1250 minus 16 times 25. So the whole thing is still all divided by h. So we have the limit as h approaches 0. And let's expand this brackets now. So 16 times 25 is 400 minus 160h minus 16h squared, minus, and let's 
do a calculation here. So we get 1250. Actually, let's erase the bracket so we can get rid of that. So we have minus 1250 and then plus, because this has a minus, distributing to the negative. 16 times 25 is 400. And we can erase this front bracket too. All of this is divided by h. So I didn't actually join these together because I can see that this 1250 minus this 1250 goes away, negative 400 plus the 400, that goes away as well. So I'm left with, very nicely, negative 160h minus 16h squared, all divided by h. So it's nice, all the constants disappeared. And the terms that I'm left with both have an h in it, which I can cancel. So as h approaches 0, I get negative 160 minus 16h. So I'm dividing both of these numerator terms by h. Now I'm going to plug in h is 0, and I get negative 160, which is then negative 160 meters per second. So I found the instantaneous velocity at the 5 second mark. So the instantaneous velocity at 5 seconds is negative 160 meters per second. So I'm actually going to go back up here. And I know I put V of A, but I'm just going to write this also can say this is the instantaneous velocity. So I'll write it as V instantaneous. Now this formula here instantaneous velocity can apply to other rates of change. So I'm just going to rewrite this um, just to finish off. Um, so rates of change, so suppose y is a quantity that depends on another quantity x, um, then y is a function of x, and we can write this as y equals f of x. Now if x changes from x0 to x0 plus h, then we can calculate the average rate of change of y with respect to x. So we can do this as our average, and it's actually very similar to what we just did. We'll have f x naught plus h minus f of x naught, all divided by x naught plus h minus x naught. So when we simplify, you'll notice it's actually very similar to my average velocity formula. But this one can be applied to the average rate of change of anything. And lastly, if I want to consider the average rate of change over smaller and smaller intervals and say that h actually becomes or is approaching zero, then we actually will calculate the instantaneous rate of change of y with respect to x. So again, like I said before, it's actually the same formula, but instead of just finding the average, if I put in the limit as h approaches zero, then that gives me the instantaneous. If I don't have the limit, I'm actually only calculating the average. So I have the limit of f of x naught plus h minus f of x naught, and that's all divided by h.